Good afternoon. I'm Ron Shelton. I'm a member of the Historical Committee. I am participating in the 1993 ASHRAE annual meeting here in Denver, Colorado. And we're very pleased to be here this afternoon with Mr. Bern Nagengast. Bern is a consulting engineer from Sydney, Ohio. He is one of the co-authors of the soon-to-be-published ASHRAE book on uh, the history of HVAC and our industry. Um, Bern is also a past chairman of the Historical Committee. He has written numerous articles on the history of uh, our industry and ASHRAE. He's uh, also a member of the Society of um, History for Technology. And uh, welcome, Byrne. Uh, Byrne, to begin with, I'm really interested in how you first became involved in the engineering profession and especially what sparked your interest in mechanical engineering. Well, I think probably, I, I guess I would have to go all the way back to my very beginnings. I think really I was born with a, uh, a tendency towards it or a talent for it because I remember when I was a little kid being interested in all different kinds of mechanical things. Every time we would have a plumber come to the house or an electrician or something, I was right there to watch what he was doing. Uh, when I used to play with my toys, in addition to all the normal things that you would do, I used to take pieces of string and tie them all together and, and, and try to make machines out of them, you might say. Uh, I can remember uh, a period of time when I used to take the, the daily newspaper and cut the gutter strips off of the newspaper, the white strips that surround the text, and cut out the crossword puzzles, and then take all those strips and crossword puzzles and lay them out all over the floor and connect them together to make systems of pipes and tanks and, and things of that nature. Uh, when I got old enough to start to be able to pick up a crayon and draw, I used to try to draw mechanical systems and such uh, on my coloring books. And, and for some reason, I had the ability to be able to block out the black lines that were on the coloring books and, and just see a blank page, essentially. And then I would uh, draw some type of a heating system or, or something and as, as I envisioned the inside of a boiler, for example, or something like that. And, uh, uh, continued to do that for some length of time. And so I guess I had an interest in, in the mechanical side of things for a long time. And I went through a period of time when I wanted to be a plumber or I wanted to be an electrician or this or that. And I think the thing that catalyzed my interest in this particular industry was the fact that my father was a retail florist and his shop which was fairly good size, had a pretty good size heating system for the greenhouses and also had refrigeration systems to keep the flowers cool. And uh, I was always fascinated with those systems and used to spend sometimes as much as a couple hours just looking at those systems, going over, following pipes and so on and so forth to see uh, where they went and, and trying to figure out how the system worked. And uh, when I was about, uh, oh, probably 14 years old or so, uh, they had to put a new walk-in cooler in uh, at the shop. And the guy who was doing the refrigeration work, uh, I found out when he was going to be there. And after school, I went right over there and wormed my way into where he was working and, uh, and asked him if I could watch him. Well, pretty soon he started uh, asking me some questions about uh, if I knew what he was doing and so on. And, and we ended up uh, getting into an interesting conversation where where he started asking me things about what he was doing and, and explaining to me how the system worked and, and I asked him questions and when we got to the end of that, uh, that day he said, how would you like to come back on Saturday and I'll pay you to help me put the rest of the system in? Well, I was absolutely elated. <laughs> so, so I went back on Saturday with my dad when, when he went to work that morning and I spent the whole day with this man and at the end of the day he paid me a dollar for my help which was uh, essentially just handing him things every once in a while. But the whole time I was asking him questions and, and he said, when you get to be 18 years old, he said, why don't you come and see me and I'll hire you for the summer. He said, I always hire somebody to help me during the summertime. Well, when I was 18, I went to him and by that time he had had some health problems and had to hire somebody full time and he, he couldn't do it. So he asked me to go ahead and uh, uh, go to some of the other refrigeration companies in the area and see if I could get a job with them. And one of the things that he told me uh, during this period of time when I used to see him every once in a while was he said, uh, 
you should go into this industry, but you shouldn't go into this industry as a mechanic. You should go into it as an engineer. He said, because I have to work long hours in all kinds of hot, dirty conditions. And he said, and I really don't get paid much. And he said, uh, you should design the systems, not fix the systems. And he really encouraged me to go into the engineering profession. So uh, when I was in high school, I had pretty much decided that I wanted to go into uh, some type of a uh, technical design type field, uh, particularly something to do with heating and ventilating, refrigeration, and so on, because it combined all of the different things that I had an interest in. It combined electricity and piping and uh, mechanical systems and, and the whole thing. So uh, when it came time to try to select a college, I got my dad to take me to Rensselaer Polytechnic Institute in Troy, New York, which was, of course, one of the premier engineering colleges, to find out what an engineer did. And the guy who spoke to me frankly discouraged me about engineering because uh, he really didn't give me, I don't think, a very good explanation of what an engineer did. It really didn't fire me up. And so I uh, instead decided to get a two-year technical degree in air conditioning technology at the local community college, Hudson Valley Community College. Mm -hmm. This is um, in Albany? This, this is, uh, the, the community college was in Troy, New York, mm -hmm. which is, was located about 10 miles away from Albany. Uh, fortunately, they had a pretty good program there, and uh, while I was there, the department head of that school one time came in and gave uh, a talk to the class, and he said, some of you, no doubt, are going to decide that you want to go on and get an engineering degree, and I think uh, that you should certainly do that, and the best place in the world to go for an engineering degree in this field is California State Polytechnic College in San Luis Obispo, California. And my first reaction to that was, this guy's out of his mind. I'm not going to go clear across the country to go to college. But uh, uh, he was very encouraging of the idea, and several of us in the class kind of discussed this among ourselves. And, and we sort of, you might say, bootstrapped each other to the point where we all decided to, to go there. And so three of us transferred at the end of our last year at Hudson mm -hmm. Valley to uh, California Polytechnic uh, uh, university as it is called now and I enrolled in their program which uh, was designated environmental engineering and uh, with a specialty in air conditioning uh, refrigeration plumbing and heating and uh, I ultimately got my engineering degree there and then stayed for an additional one and a half years and got a master's degree in business and, and then decided to go to work and I guess uh, by that time I was so interested in this field that I decided I didn't want to stop learning after I graduated. And so I thought it's important to try to go to work for somebody who can teach me something. And by that time I had been reading a lot of the trade press and used to go to uh, uh, any type of educational seminars or anything that I could to listen to people in the industry. And I started to identify that there were certain people in the industry who seemed to be well known and seemed to have a lot of knowledge about different aspects of the industry. And by that time I had decided that I wanted to probably specialize in the refrigeration industry. So. I decided I wanted to work only for a few certain people in the country who I thought could really teach me something. And I applied for jobs with those people. And uh, it turned out that uh, some of them, for various reasons, couldn't hire me. Uh, and ultimately, the job that I did uh, end up going to was uh, one with Copeland Corporation in Sydney, Ohio, as an application engineer, because the manager of the department at the time, John Grimm, was well known within the industry uh, for his, uh, his expertise. And, and I thought I could get a good general education from him. Uh, so I spent uh, uh, the next seven years at Copeland Corporation you know, working for him and uh, learned a tremendous amount. In fact, I was delighted to hear when I went to work for him that the very first day he said to me, if you stick with this job at the end of one year, you will be a walking encyclopedia of knowledge of the applications of refrigeration, uh, uh, you know, and, and that was just what I wanted. And uh, it turned out that, that that did happen. Well, at the end of seven years, uh, I had for a long time started started to think that I wanted to go into business for myself. And uh, so uh, at the end of seven years, I ended up leaving the company and uh, decided to go into consulting engineering work. And uh, at the same time, I also purchased an existing mail order company that dealt in coin storage supplies, since I happened to be a coin collector. And I did that uh, to try to tide me over monetarily until I built the consulting business up. And it turned out the mail order business worked out pretty good, and, and I had to actually uh, turn down consulting work. But uh, that, that's really the story of how I got into engineering and, and why I was interested in it. When did you first join ASHRAE? 
I joined ASHRAE as a student member in 1968. That's when I was at Hudson Valley Community College, and mm -hmm. they were very strong supporters of ASHRAE. They encouraged all of us mm -hmm. to uh, become student members, and we were fortunate that the uh, Northeastern New York chapter of ASHRAE, which operated in that area, was also very encouraging, and they once a year had a student night where they would invite uh, all of the students from the local area that had anything to do with the industry and sponsor them uh, out of their own pockets as student members of ASHRAE for the first year uh, and uh, anyone who wanted to join and of course uh, you know uh, most of the class joined since it didn't cost anything <laughs> but the thing is that and 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 I you know really uh, you know thought it was important to become a member of the society even at that early time from what I had been told about the society mm -hmm. uh, because I thought that it was important by that time to to be uh, a good technical designer you also had to know a little bit of the nuts and bolts of the system and and so the next year I joined refrigeration service engineer society to get the more practical side of things and I've been a member of both organizations ever since. When did you first start going to ASHRAE meetings? Not until I went to work for Copeland. Okay. Uh, I, I really never went to the, the regular meetings until after I you know, went to work. And, and fortunately, my boss, John Grimm at Copeland, w who was an ASHRAE member, was also encouraging of, uh, of participation uh, within the society. Mm -hmm. He participated himself. Yeah. And, uh, and fortunately, I was able to attend some of the meetings you know, once I went to work for Copeland. But somewhere in there, you began to develop an interest in the history of the technology. Of, That's uh, true, HBIC. and I, I think the, uh, you know, in, in thinking back, it's, it's hard to pinpoint exactly, you know, when, you know, the, that I could say when exactly I developed that, but I think what happened was the systems that I was exposed to back when I was growing up in Albany, New York at my father's shop and so on, they were older systems, mm -hmm. uh, and, and I think I somehow got a basic appreciation for this old equipment as a result uh, when I started doing uh, summer service work in between my quarter at Cal Poly, uh, the equipment I worked on many, in many cases was older equipment. And the, this particular company that I worked for during that time uh, back in Albany, Capital Refrigeration Company, their service manager had gone to work for the, that particular company in 1933. And uh, he was very familiar with the older systems. And the fact that I had to work on some of these older systems, I used to ask him questions about them. And, uh, and he used to tell me a lot of interesting stories about this, uh, you know, old equipment and in the way that you used to have to work on this type of equipment and uh, and it got to the point where I started asking him questions that he couldn't answer uh, and and that sparked my curiosity in terms of when things were developed and why they were developed and uh, things of that mm -hmm. nature so uh, so when I went to Cal Poly I used to sometimes spend uh, my spare time going to the Cal Poly library and looking at old issues of refrigerating engineering and things like that. Yeah. And, uh, and that uh, further sparked my interest in it. And once I graduated, I maintained the interest just as a hobby, you might say, in terms of trying mm -hmm. to, uh, when I would go to an ASHRAE meeting, for example, one of the first things I would do was to try to find out if there was a good library in the town. And I would go to the library, you know, when I had some spare moments and look on their card catalog under heating and ventilation and refrigeration and see what kind of material they had and then if something struck my fancy I'd you know go and take a look at it. Did you start writing any papers on the history of HVAC when you were in school? The, the, first, the, the first article I wrote uh, was while I was at Cal Poly. When I was, uh, if, if I remember right, I think it was when I was a, a, maybe a, a senior at Cal Poly or so. And uh, I had, uh, uh, by, that, by that time, I developed a pretty strong idea that in order to be a good engineer, you needed to not only have a good theoretical knowledge, but you also had to have uh, uh, what you would call a practical knowledge of, of the, you know, as I mm -hmm. had said earlier, the nuts and bolts side of, of systems and equipment. And I also, by that time, had developed appreciation for what had been done before, and I thought a good engineer ought to have a historical knowledge as well in terms of, mm -hmm. uh, you know, things that, uh, that had gone before him so he didn't essentially reinvent things all over again when he was designing mm -hmm. a system. And I went to the department head, uh, Jim McGrath, at, uh, at Cal Poly, and I said, uh, you know, told him about this, and, and I said, you know, do you think the ASHRAE Journal would uh, would entertain an article from a student member of the society. And he said, 
I think that they would not only entertain it, he said, I think that uh, they would be delighted to publish something like that if it was a good mm. article. And he said, I'll tell you what, he said, you write the article up, and if it is a good article, I'll send it personally to the editor of the journal and recommend that they publish mm -hmm. it. Uh, so anyway, I did write the article, and, uh, and he took a look at it, and he said, uh, made, made some suggestions. And the thing that was interesting was he said, uh, he said, you know, he said, if you publish this in the ASHRAE Journal, this has got to be a very rigorous article. And he said, and you've got to be very careful about what you say and how you say it. And he said, because there's going to be some people in the society, such as, uh, and he, he mentioned Bill Holiday, uh, who, who is still living, you know, are going to see this kind of material and they'll tear it to shreds if you don't you know really do a good job so anyway I ended up rewriting the article and after I rewrote it he thought it was pretty good and he sent it in and they did publish it and, and it was uh, let's say I think it was published in 1972 if I remember right and it was uh, the quest for knowledge a student's personal viewpoint is what the title of the article was when did you get on the ASHRAE Historical Committee? Well, the interesting thing is that mm -hmm. it, it connects with this article mm -hmm. because uh, Jim McGrath was the, uh, I, I believe he was the second chairman of the Historical Committee, which was founded in 1974. And uh, Jim McGrath knew of my interest in, uh, in history. He also was aware of the fact that my senior project at Cal Poly for graduation was a historical project where I studied the design of refrigeration condensing units and how they had progressed in design. Mm -hmm. uh, he apparently was the one who suggested uh, to whoever was appointing members at the time to committees that, uh, that I would be a good member for the Historical Committee, and, and as a result, I was appointed to the committee for the first time in 1974. And this was, of course, after I had left Cal Poly and was working for Copeland Corporation. Uh, so I started coming to Historical Committee meetings, and uh, uh, pretty soon my boss, John Grimm, got uh, somewhat miffed at that I was spending company time going to meetings of a committee that really didn't have anything to do with direct technical type things. And uh, he basically told me, well, you know, you can go to the meetings if they're fairly close or if they happen to conjunct with the ARI show where we would send you, you know, anyway. Mm -hmm. But otherwise, uh, I, I really can't, you know, afford to send you, you know, to a meeting. So anyway, because of the fact that I couldn't attend that many meetings, I ended up not lasting on the committee for a very long time initially. And I think I ended up uh, being dropped from the committee after oh, maybe a year or a year and a half or so. Uh, it wasn't too long after that where I, I was able to start to attend the meetings more often, and I started to attend the historical committee meetings just out of interest in what they were doing and uh, expressed an interest that I would like to rejoin the committee if that was possible, and, and I was ultimately appointed to the committee uh, once again. I think uh, it was 1980 was when I was appointed again to the committee, and I've served in some capacity with the committee pretty much continuously ever since. They won't let you go. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's right. They yeah. found somebody who, uh, who w was willing to do, I guess, a little bit of work for them mm -hmm. or something. And when did this idea of, about a history book for HVAC first, uh, first come about? The, the thing that happened was uh, the historical committee uh, began to entertain the ideas of, uh, of, of celebrating the society's centennial. And this really was, I, I, I suppose I could probably take credit for bringing that up initially, because when I was chairman of the historical committee for the first time, uh, about 1985 or so, I suggested to the committee that even though the centennial was 10 years down the road, they really should start to prepare for it, you know, starting 10 years in advance because of the fact that it was the 100th anniversary and it was something very significant and that you can't wait till the last minute to do something. Uh, and so I asked the committee to come up with suggestions for things that, that could be done for the centennial. Well, it turned out that Barry Donaldson, who was a member of the committee at the time, uh, was, was really the one who suggested the book. He suggested that the society publish what he called a catalog of, of heating, ventilating, air conditioning, and refrigeration history. Uh, and that was in 1985 that he made that suggestion. Well, within a short period of time, we, we entertained a lot of different ideas, and the committee distilled the ideas down to just, just a few ideas, one of which was this book. By that time, the idea had, had gelled to the point where we started to think in terms of pictorial history, primarily a pictorial history. And uh, 
I think that, uh, uh, you know, Barry certainly thought that was a good idea. He volunteered to, uh, uh, you know, to write the book, but he, he mentioned the fact that he really wasn't particularly proficient in the air conditioning and refrigeration history side, that his forte was more in the, uh, the heating and ventilating side. And so I piped up and said that I would be willing to work with him on the book, you know, on the other side of the, the subject, the refrigeration and air conditioning history. And that's how we uh, became, uh, you know, co-workers on the project. Project, and we've been working on the project since 1985. Uh, and of course, we realized once we got into it that, uh, that it was a, a pretty big undertaking. And we realized that we couldn't cover the entire industry because you'd be writing an encyclopedia in that case. And so then we decided to be more selective in terms of covering various uh, aspects, particularly important milestones. And I think as time went on, we realized that what we wanted to do was to point out some of the things that really affected uh, the, uh, the impact of the industry on the human race. You know, the fact that this industry had a, an immense impact on, on people that, that we have a tendency to take for granted now. Uh, the other thing challenge was to make it interesting because, you know, as anybody knows, if you, uh, unless you're a dyed-in-the-wool historian, nobody's interested in, in reading history. And, and That's right. And, and, and most of the, the material that had been published having to do with the history of this industry was, was primarily text-type material. Mm -hmm. uh, it was interesting for somebody like me to read, but it certainly wasn't interesting for most other people to read, I don't think. And so we wanted to try to do something that would present the history in an interesting way so that people would pick up a book and say, wow, this is really interesting stuff mm -hmm. in here to look at. And even if they just looked at the pictures and didn't read anything, mm -hmm. you know, they, they would want to do that. And if they started reading some of the things, they would find all kinds of interesting things to read. And so we tried to interject uh, humorous anecdotes. That's and, true, right? Things of that you nature. Know, some of those kind of personal anecdotes that look like it'd be a little difficult to to establish the information for that, but apparently you found enough literature that. Uh, well, well, the thing that's interesting is that when when I went back and started to look at the things that had already been done, I would find you know somebody would talk about some some particular individual had invented something or had done something at a certain time, and maybe they would tell a little bit about what they had done, but they they dropped it at that point. And and to me, it was interesting to go into well, you know, why did this guy do that? Uh, you know, was there anything interesting mm -hmm. about that? You know, how did uh, this thing that, that he invented, uh, why was it important? How did it work? Uh, and, and so I tried to do research into that, uh, that, that particular thing. And, and it turned out, of course, that for, uh, as usual with anything that you write, you have to do about maybe a hundred times worth of research for every little bit that mm -hmm. you write. And the research really was the thing that was, was very, very time consuming. In fact, the writing, in my estimation, was, was, was quite easy to do once the research was done. Mm -hmm. But, you know, I, I think that's because I, I seem to be able to, after I do the research, I can mull it over in my mind, uh, you know, for a while and then be able to put it down on paper pretty rapidly. And uh, I thought about that for a long time as to why I can do that, because it sometimes amazes me myself that I can do that. And, and I think it's, uh, I remember reading one time uh, some material by Napoleon Hill, who studied the life of Andrew Carnegie. And he was the author of books like uh, Think and Grow Rich and things of this mm -hmm. nature. And, and he had something in his books where he talked about the ability of people to tap into the subconscious mind which in turn allows them to tap into what he called infinite intelligence, which, you know, the concept of God. And the thing that, that's interesting is that I, I thought about maybe that's what happens when I write this material, that, that I do a lot of this research and I basically mm -hmm. absorb this material and it gets uh, molded over in my subconscious mind and next thing you know I have an idea of how I want to write it and, and when I sit down to actually write the material, the material comes out faster than I can put it down usually. I mean, I, can, I, I can't even write it as fast as I can think the material out. And usually when I write it, I'll, I'll let it lay for a while, I'll go back a week later and look at it again, and I think to myself, gee, did I write this? It, it really is almost like this material came Explodes. from mm -hmm. from somewhere, and, and it wasn't a conscious situation. And, uh, and, and it, it amazes me that I wrote the material sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, where do a lot of your visual materials come from? I mean, you, you obviously that's a major portion of the book, and yeah, you captured a lot of that through uh, industry journals. 
That's right. Um, well, one of the things that I found out was that I understand why people who did historical material before didn't use a lot of pictures, because that is even harder to get than the research material from a text standpoint. It's, it's very difficult to get the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the visual material. And what I really did was uh, essentially it was a matter of, of going to every source I could think of where I might be able to locate that material. Some of the material came from in industry type archives, such as uh, uh, material on uh, household refrigeration that came mm -hmm. from uh, the General Motors Institute collection of industrial history, or the, the General Electric Hall of History, or, or places like that. But you're right that a lot of the material had to come from industry journals. And unfortunately, they aren't necessarily the best reproductions because they're half tones in, in magazines and so on. But the thing is that that's the best we have available in some cases because the original photographs that they used, you know, usually have long since disappeared by now and there's, there's no way that you mm -hmm. can access the material directly. But uh, it was really a matter of, uh, of, of, you might say, looking for a needle in a haystack. I, I found out that uh, a long time ago that the only way that you can really find the good historical material is by sheer uh, legwork and, and, and sheer tenacity in terms of having to take, for example, a set of industry journals and start at the beginning and go page by page through every single one of them. Uh, and, and, you know, you may be talking about mm -hmm. thousands of pages of material to have to process to do that, but mm -hmm. that's how you find the really good material because a lot of times if you take the shortcut method that researchers usually do, which is to use indexes, the indexes leave out a lot of good material. Uh, and, and a lot mm -hmm. of times the title of an article won't tell you what the article actually contained. For example, if you're going to study the history of air conditioning, if you go back to early articles dealing with the subject, air conditioning isn't the term that's used. Uh, for example, uh, an article that's entitled The Refrigeration of Dwellings you know, might be a title of an article that, that deals with the air conditioning of mm -hmm. dwellings as we know it now, but you would never know that from the title unless you saw the article right in front of you and saw what it dealt with. And uh, it's the, the whole thing is a matter of, uh, I guess, putting together a jigsaw puzzle. Mm -hmm. You know, you find a little bit of information here, a little bit of information here, there, and gradually it all kind of fits together. I presume you had a lot of material to cover the later periods. Where, what about the material for the earlier times? Because you started in the ancient We really started with ancient times mm -hmm. and, and went forward. And of course, the, uh, the, there isn't a lot of material in ancient times because there really wasn't a lot done. Uh, you know, the cooling technology virtually didn't exist. Refrigeration technology didn't really exist except for the use of snow, for example, to cool wine or something. And heating technology, well, that you're talking about really the ancient Romans for the most part. And then for a long period of time, there really was very little technology in the, the so-called Dark Ages period. And it isn't until you get to the Renaissance period that you start to see, and the Industrial Revolution after that, that you see a block of, of the technology as we know it today. And of course, the, uh, what happened was you have the basic developments of, of science and technology back then, and, and you get to the point where when you get up to about the 1930s or so, at that point, a lot of the basic discoveries have already been made. And from that point on, we're talking about a refinement of the technology. And for that reason, Barry and I chose to, uh, to not deal with uh, the technology beyond the 1930s in the book. Uh, for that reason and also because it starts to become very difficult uh, to judge history when you get too close to it. Uh, we can tell now, uh, 60 or 70 years ago, what were the really significant things that impacted this industry for a long period of time. But if we talk about something in the last 10 or 20 or 30 years, it's, hard, it's very difficult to tell whether that's just a flash in the pan or whether it's something that really will be considered to be historically significant as time goes on. You know, I really enjoyed reading the parts of the book about the formation, of, for example, of ASHVE. And, and how the engineers broke apart from the master steam fitters. I can understand that as an engineer uh, wanting to get on with the engineering part of it uh, apart from the business side of the house. And I presume a similar kind of thing happened with ASRE. Yeah, and I think the, uh, the, the, the most 
probably the most challenging history to write was the history of, of the organization itself because that material is the most difficult material to make interesting to people. Uh, you know, un unless you happen to be one of the, the people personally involved in something, you know, you don't particularly want to read about, you know, a lot of these types of developments having to do with the organization of, of a society and so on and so forth. But the thing that makes it interesting is when you can get back into the, again, the personal anecdotes and, and the reasons uh, why the society was formed and, and that's what struck me when I started working on that particular part of the history was uh, you know why did this why was the society formed who formed it you know why why did these uh, why did uh, a group of individuals get together and do this mm -hmm. and and I found out that there was some very interesting material you know relating to that you know some very human material <laughs> I guess it took someone like a Hugh Barron with that type of personality to get that organization started. That's right, and, and essentially he, he thought there should be another organization because he didn't, he didn't like the way he was, uh, the science of, of the industry was being treated by the Master uh, Steamfitters Association. And, and that's really, you know, in a capsule form what happened. Well, Bern, I, I'm certainly looking forward to the publication of your book. Uh, do you have any future plans at this time? I, I have no doubt that I'll continue to uh, to publish articles and, and things of that nature, you know, probably for the rest of my life in this particular area be because of, of my interest. And I do think it's very important to share the knowledge. I think the fact that if I had, uh, you know, the, the time and the ability to go out and dig out all this material and everything, it doesn't belong just up in my head. It belongs in the hands of, of a lot of other people that they can take a look at it. And I think that it, it is important to take what I discovered and to try to put it out in an interesting format so that other people can uh, you know get the benefit of the work that I did uh, that's the reason why I think it's important that the background material for the book the research material and the illustrative material and so on all of that material we're going to turn over to the ASHRAE library and archives so that it will be available for other people to use down the road so that they don't have to go trekking all over the country to all these different libraries and sources and things and trying to dig this information out we'll have it all in one spot well, Bern, I know you've spent years contributing segments to other people's publications and books, and I'm, I'm very happy to see that you've got something out now that's unique to your own authorship. Well, I, I guess it was just a matter of, you know, as, as somebody, when somebody else is doing something, if they find out that somebody can help them out and they've got something they can use, of course, you know, it saves them a lot of work, and, and I'm all too willing to help them out mm -hmm. if, if I can. Well, I've, I've certainly learned a lot from uh, our association over the last two or three years, and uh, I must admit, I've, I've enjoyed trekking through some of the better libraries in Washington with you and, <laughs> and seeing uh, some of the things uh, that they pull out in the patent office that uh, old I saws and, and uh, searching through the Smithsonian. But uh, no, you just have to be prepared to be uh, to work uh, work mm -hmm. and get hot and dirty, and that's <laughs> <laughs> really what happens. I think some of these uh, old materials that I look at sometimes nobody's looked at them in 50 years because they're covered mm -hmm. with dust typically. <laughs> Well, Ashray is very fortunate to have someone like you, Byrne, that has certainly put in just countless hours uh, as a volunteer to produce a document of such quality and, and significance to our industry. I, I don't, you know, I don't think I, uh, I should get so much credit. Really, mm -hmm. you know, what I did, anybody can do. It's, it, mm -hmm. it's the material is out there. It isn't like I, uh, you know, invented all of this, this information. You know, it, mm -hmm. it was there, and it simply takes the time and the effort to go and it look at the material. It takes a lot of tenacity and. Uh and certainly a certain type of personality to go after that. Oh, uh, uh, yeah, you have to be nuts. Somebody that <laughs> <laughs> used to sit and assemble crossword puzzles on the floor when they were a kid. Well, maybe, uh, <laughs> maybe so. <laughs> Byrne, I want to thank you very much for sharing your time with us this afternoon. Oh, that's okay, Ron. It was a pleasure, and I encourage anybody to do the same thing. <laughs>